Okay, I didn't uh, pause that first one. I stopped it, so this is the second one, but it carries on right there. Um, I always ask myself, as I see your your interesting majors, you know, that you're uh, studying uh, uh, to go into the medical field or to go into business or to go into uh, teaching at some level, um, I say, why do they need figurative language? Why do they need these elements that I'm talking about? Um, and just, just the other day, I was talking to my godson. He's a fitness trainer and like a motivational person. And he was talking about negativity and positivity and how they are two lanes. And he said, you, you, you get positive. You're as positive as you can be. And you're in that lane. And that's a good lane to be. You'll probably go faster. But when you're negative and complaining and feeling down, you're, you're in a separate lane and you can get stuck in that lane. And that's going to lead to a bad place. Um, and uh, as we were talking about it, I was like, yeah, when you're in a certain lane, um, you, you, you kind of create a groove. Like if you're in that negative lane, you're not going anywhere. You're going back and forth. So you create a deeper groove in that lane and you get more stuck. And his, his metaphor, uh, his extended metaphor, um, and, my, and our talking about it um, gave me some insights into the values of having a positive attitude. It's, you know, it's not just, a, it's not just, um, you know, so, so you'll be in a better mood and people will, uh, enjoy being around you more. It's so that you go faster and get to the right exit and you don't get st stuck in a negative groove. Um, so in whatever career you're going to go, figuring life out and solving problems is helped by what we're studying here, I believe. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take time uh, with it. Um, all right. So thank you, uh, Keyshawn, for that uh, good question that got me thinking. Um, Kayla Wright also asked a good question. She's in section VC. I, and I feel like one of the sections, I forget which one, is posting a lot more in the forum. So, so in, and we have roughly the same numbers. So in week three, I'm going to throw out this little challenge. Whichever section posts the most posts in the forum before the deadline, everybody in that section who posted anything is getting 20, 20 bonus points. That's a whole forum week. That's a whole journal. Okay. So section VC, section VD, get in there. Serious posts only, please. Whenever I have these challenges, Students don't post empty posts because you know I'm in there reading, right? I actually speed read. That was my first job after college was speed reading. So I will be reading those posts. And um, whichever group has the most posts by Sunday at the end of the day is going to get that 20 extra points. Now, the fourth essay of the semester, we have four essays. In the last one, I ask you to trace a theme you see running through um at least three pieces we've read this semester. And one of them should be a substantial one that I've done one of these video talks on. So Sunny Blues, Sunny's Blues could be one of them. So I want to demo for you what I mean by trace a theme. Um, and this also came out of someone's question. And the questioner, you may recognize it. Um, and I may remember the name of the person. Um, what, what I see in this story is a theme of listening or not listening. It's about a musician. It's about Sonny. Or is it about the older brother? There's always that question with this story. And if you go out online and read a little bit about the story, which has been studied and taught, you know, everywhere, um, you'll see that people ask, is the main character the older brother, the math teacher, or is it Sonny? He's in the title, Sonny's Blues. But either way, either answer to that, um, one of the main characters is a jazz musician. And the other main character, his older brother, doesn't hear it at the beginning. In fact, he doesn't hear Sonny. That's, that's why they have arguments. So I want to trace the theme of listening through this story. And you could trace the theme of listening or of opposites or of family ties or anything through three through all of American literature, through movies. But but all I ask you to do in essay four is uh, is three or more pieces from the semester 
And you can bring in something else from outside the course, a movie, a TV series, anything. So, you, <clears throat> so you're going to trace a theme. Um, and now I'm going to demo that for you. So I'm still with the printout. And three pages into the story on page 20, three or four pages into the story. Um, this is when uh, Sonny, Sonny's older brother, the math teacher, is, it's still the first day. He just got the news from the newspaper article. And a friend of Sonny's is waiting for him when he leaves after school to, to go to the subway. And they have a conversation. And at first, the older brother, this is why I love this story. The older brother is kind of like us. Because we're, we're finding out about Sonny through his point of view and his memories. But he's judgmental. He's trying to be a middle class guy. He's trying to be a math teacher. You know, he, he wouldn't even go near drugs. And here Sonny is a heroin addict and a jazz musician, which at, which at that time, jazz was like, you know, considered, you know, the devil's work. And the blues, especially the blues, uh, was considered, you know, by church people, which James Baldwin was. His father was a well-known preacher in Harlem, and he, as a young man, actually preached, like, at 13 years old. He was known as, like, this amazing, brilliant preacher because he had that verbal genius, okay? So, so you've got the older brother judging the younger brother. And some readers might be judging the younger brother, drug addict, right? Um, so we get to know everything through the older brother's point of view. And insofar as he doesn't listen, we don't listen. And then when he listens more and more and starts to get things more and more, we do too. At least that's my experience of my own reading of this story, my own reflection on my own reactions. So um, here's a kind of the street guy that is a friend of Sonny's. Look, don't tell me your sad story, the brother says. If it was up to me, I'd give you one. Because the guy had said, I'd, I'd kill myself if I had a gun. He says that. He's being tough. Then I felt guilty. Guilty probably for never, never having supposed the poor bastard had a story of his own, much less a sad one. And I asked quickly, what's going to happen to him now? He didn't answer this. He was off by himself someplace. Funny thing, he said. And from his tone, we might have been discussing the quickest way to get to Brooklyn. When I saw the papers this morning, the first thing I asked myself was if I had anything to do with it. I felt sort of responsible. This is Sonny's childhood friend saying. I began to listen more carefully, the older brother says. Now, in the journal, there's a quote and pinpoint in week three. It's a type of journal post. And that's what you do. You pull out a short quote. I began to listen more carefully. And then you just pinpoint the importance of that quote in the story. Okay. So he starts listening there. That's my first example. Let me see if I can find my page with all of the... Uh... Okay. Now I'm going to go to page... Just right next door to page 21. Right next door to that. So that he continues to talk to his brother's friend, who it seems, um, you know, first told him about drugs and how great they were when they were in middle school. So he says, Then I wanted to ask him too many things. He could not have answered, or if he had, I could not have borne the answers. So he's, this is an amazing day for him, because he's recognizing he hasn't been listening, and now he's saying, I wish I had been listening, and I want it, but maybe I can't handle the answers. So he's getting to know himself here. So that to me says maybe this, he is the main character, that the action is happening inside him, even though the title is Sonny's Blues. Um, but I'm not sure. That's just my take on it. So in your essay, I know people get nervous. Oh, if I write an essay, what if I'm wrong? I don't care if you're wrong. This is not a literature class. What I care is you write a good essay and you explain your interpretation. You could be like, no, Sonny is the main character. That's the one I'm interested in. The main drama is happening with him. Well, go ahead and argue that. That could be your whole paper. And I'd be like, wow, this, this student's committed. This student has an opinion on the story. That's what I want you to do. I want you to have an opinion on stuff 
and explain your opinion. That's all I'm asking. That's going to be a good paper. You know, don't get nervous about writing the paper, but do read, or if you're doing one of the videos, view it. View it like seven times. That identity is only five minutes long. So view it a bunch of times. The, the camel and his friends, that's only, you know, it's this big. So read it 20 times until you, you have something to say. So I want to go, I want to skip to page um, uh, 23. So our main character's daughter dies, the little baby dies. We don't get any exposition on that until very late in the story, and I wonder why we get it when we get it, what happened to her. She had polio. Oh, is polio still a problem? I don't think it is. So that tells you something about when the story was written. Hint, hint. Okay. So um, his daughter dies, and he's like, it breaks his heart, and then he, for some reason, he's more compassionate toward his brother in prison, and he's, he, he's because he's suffering, he feels his brother's suffering. Uh, suffering is a theme you could trace through the whole semester, because it's a human question that we've had since the beginning of time. Why, why does stuff happen to us? Why do children get cancer? You know, why is all that? And writers and painters and musicians and all kinds of artists, dancers, they're trying to answer those big questions that have been with us forever. So you are now involved in that quest to figure this stuff out. Okay. So he writes to his brother. He gets a letter back. This is the first time they've talked in years. Then, after he got the first letter back, then I kept in constant touch with him, and I sent him whatever I could. And I went to meet him when he came back to New York. That one sentence covers a lot of time. There's a lot of exposition in that, that a different writer that was just trying to entertain us, they might spend a page on that. Um, when I saw him, many things I thought I had forgotten came flooding back to me. This was because I had finally begun to wonder about Sonny. Ah, he's starting to wonder, finally. Um, and I, re I read that sentence wrong. Just I mixed up two words. Let's look at the way Baldwin wrote it. So I read, this was because I had finally begun to wonder about Sonny. And Baldwin wrote, this was because I had begun, finally, to wonder about Sonny. And that finally has commas on either side. And as I said to somebody in Section BC, commas, there's rules about when to use commas and not, but... Uh, about one third of comma use is style. It's a style choice. It's a tone. It creates the tone. So when he puts commas on either side of finally, almost like parentheses, that finally has a light shining on it. That finally is louder than the other words in the sentence. I had begun finally to wonder about Sonny. And that finally is in his heart, you know? He's like, ah. And if you read the story, you know what he said to his mother the last time he saw his mother. And you know what she asked him to do and what he did not do. Okay. So I'm still tracing that theme of listening. Um, and I want to jump to page 34. I know this is getting a little long, but you can pause it um, and go eat some bacon or whatever. And some eggs. <laughs> Somebody's cooking those in my house. But I have my own breakfast, so I'm not, I'm not tempted. Okay, 34. I'm going to page 34 in this printout. And as I said earlier, there's a link to that in week two. And you can have it up on your screen. Or you can print it out. That's what I do so I can write on it. Or you can look at it in the textbook, but the pages will be different. You just have to find it. You can pause me and find it. So I'm going to, the scene I'm going to is, oh God, I love this scene. Um, I just told you, that's, that's a paragraph, so if you can find that. Uh, Sonny says, um, he's talking about, they've been living together I think a few weeks, and they're, Sonny's never home when the older brother comes home. It's probably a small apartment, but this time... The brother's there, and he's thinking, should I search Sonny's room? And he doesn't, but he's thinking maybe he should because he's worried he's going to start using again. Um, so the brother comes in, and the older brother says, you know, I'm worried you're going to start using again. He finally, They finally actually have a real conversation. Um, 
And they, they, as we do when we have arguments with people, we rehash old stuff. So the older brother says, he thinks, then I got mad. It was because I was so scared. You must be crazy, you goddamn fool. What the hell do you want to do? What the hell do you want to go and join the army for? Oh, I'm sorry. This is earlier in the story than I said. This this is in the long flashback in the middle of the story. It's a four-page flashback. So he's remembering when Sonny was still in high school and he his mother had asked him to, you know, be there for Sonny, so he was trying, but he didn't he wasn't listening, he didn't understand him. He had he didn't know what it was to live with an artist, a musician. Uh, but really Baldwin does because Baldwin's writing the story, so Baldwin's more like Sonny in some ways. Um but I but I feel like he's writing about He's more like the, the older math teacher. But that's another question. You know, is this autobiographical? Is this based on his own family? I know Baldwin was the oldest in a large family and uh, did have some caretaking responsibilities for the little kids like you do when you're the oldest. Um, and I also know that he lived in Paris for a big uh, section of his life uh, to get away from the racism in America and that one of his brothers did live with him in Paris. So maybe he had, a you know, a parental type role uh, with this brother. Um, so they're having this argument and Sonny uh, pulls away and says, you never hear anything I say. So again, that theme of listening. It's only a little quote, but I'm trying to string together. I call this a string of quotes type essay. I want to string together three or four quotes that shine light on this question or this theme of listening throughout the piece. And it, once I started doing it, I actually found one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I actually found nine quotes that I could use. I could write a very long essay on listening in this piece. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, I want to jump ahead to page 42 in the printout. Oh, I'm going to skip the exposition about what happened to Gracie was the daughter's name. The writing there is amazing. I should just read this whole thing aloud to you. Um, okay, this is the conversation when it's not in the flashback. Sonny has actually moved in. He's been there for a couple weeks. And this is where they're having their conversation. Sonny has come home. He's, he's saying, you know, I don't want you to kill yourself by doing drugs. And, um, oh, let me just back up a little bit. They're talking about suffering. Oh, and they've listened to that, the music in the street. And then they're talking about that. He stood up and walked to the window and remained silent. They've been talking about why people do drugs, and the older brother says, And what about you? What about you? Do you want to? Sonny has said that some musicians, blues players, jazz players want to die. He stood up and walked to the window and remained silent for a long time. Then he sighed. Me, he said. Well, while I was downstairs before on my way here listening to that woman sing, it struck me all of a sudden how much suffering she must have gone through to sing like that. It's repulsive to think you have to suffer that much. The older brother says, but there's no way not to suffer, is there, Sonny? I believe not, he said, and smiled. And I'm wondering about this whole, if, if this is the climax, this scene where they have the conversation is the climax. What do you think? But I want to, I'm trying to stay focused on listening. And, and Sonny's trying again to explain to him what it's like. It's terrible sometimes inside, he said. That's what's the trouble. You walk these streets, funky and cold, and there's not really a living ass to talk to, and there's nothing shaking, and there's no way of getting it out, that storm inside. You can't talk it, and you can't make love with it, and when you finally try to get with it and play it, you realize nobody's listening. So you've got to listen. You've got to find a way to listen. This is what Sonny has said before. Remember early in the story, he was saying, you don't listen to me when they were arguing. And now he's like, the hardest thing about being a jazz musician is listening to this something. You've got to listen to this something. But what is it? Is it the menace? Somebody asked him their questions. 
What does Baldwin mean by this sense of menace around them? What is Sonny having to listen to that he feels? He's saying sometimes you feel like you have to get high to listen to it. And his older brother says, yeah, but I don't want you to die like these other jazz musicians. So that's where Sonny is. He's in this place of my job is to listen. My life is to listen. And I have to do what I have to do to listen. And I don't want to die and I don't want to go back into that hell, you know, um, that he was in. Okay, I think I have uh, 43. There's a, oh, that, mm, oh, just keep, just read the story seven times, okay? Um, and now we get to music. Page 45. The paragraph begins, All I Know. If you can pause me and find that. We're getting to near the end of the story. It says, Sunny. No, this is our main character thinking. And he's gone to watch his brother has said, hey, I'm going to play tonight for the first time in a year. Um, I'm going to play tonight. Do you want to come? And the brother said, he's like, I don't, I better not mess this up. Of course, he says, yes, of course. You know, he knows he has to come and he has to do this for Sonny. But he doesn't know much about music. He says, he thinks to himself, all I know about music is that not many people ever really hear it. So there's the theme of listening again. And even then, on the rare occasions when something opens within and the music enters, what we mainly hear or hear corroborated are personal, private, vanishing evocations. You may not know the word evocations, but now you know the word evocations because James Baldwin just used it there in a way you can feel the tone of it, right? All we really hear are personal, private, vanishing evocations. I hear a music, I hear a song that reminds me of something from high school. It evokes in me my memories of high school. But that's not about the music, that's about me. But the music sparked that, that's why I like listening to it. But that's not the listening Sonny's talking about. There's a deeper listening. But the man who creates the music, I forgive you for that sexism, James Baldwin, you could have said the person, that might date the story. That might hint, hint. That might be get you those bonus points. But the man who created the music is hearing something else. Is dealing with the roar <coughs> rising from the void. Now, Mancari had a question about that from section VC, using that word void. No, what Mancari said is the exposition placing you in the middle of vacancy in the middle of vacancy, which is, void says the same thing, but I like the way Mancari said it. That's why I wrote it down. Okay, But the man who creates the music is hearing something else, is dealing with the roar rising from the void. And you'll remember the word roar was on the very first page. The very first paragraph. He looks out, after he's had this news about his brother, he looks out the subway car, and you know how at night you can see your face reflected in the glass, and you can see what's on the other side? I stared at it in the swinging lights of the subway car, this feeling, and in my own face, trapped in the darkness which roared outside. Well, how does darkness roar? You could say, well, he's on a subway car and that's making noise, so it feels like, the, you know, the roar is coming from outside. Or... It's a metaphor, it's figurative language for the void and all the questions and all the suffering of the past and, and his daughter dying, Gracie, at three and, and Sonny going through everything he's going through. But the man who creates the music is hearing something else, is dealing with the roar rising from the void and imposing order on it as it hits the air. You know most jazz musicians are imp improv. They're just playing. They're up there imposing order on the roar as it hits the air. What is evoked in him then is of another order, more terrible because it has no words, and triumphant too for the same reason. And his triumph, when he triumphs, is ours. I just watched Sonny's face. Sonny's up there playing. His face was troubled. He was working hard, but he wasn't with it. And I had the feeling that, in a way, everyone on the bandstand was waiting for him, both waiting for him and pushing him along. But as I began to watch Creole, that's the bass player, I realized that it was Creole 
who held them all back. He had them on a short reign, up there, keeping the beat with his whole body, wailing on the fiddle with his eyes half closed. He was listening, there's my theme, to everything. But he was listening to Sonny. He was having a dialogue with Sonny. So now not just listening, but a back and forth dialogue. He was having a dialogue with Sonny. Not literally, because they're not talking, they're playing music, but figuratively, it's like they're talking back and forth. He wanted Sonny to leave the shoreline and strike out for the deep water. He was Sonny's witness that deep water and drowning were not the same thing. He had been there and he knew and he wanted Sonny to know. He was waiting for Sonny to do the things on the keys which would let Creole know that Sonny was in the water. I'm not even going to explain that. Just read it again until you get it. And while Creole listened, in fact, I think you got it the first time through because it's that clear. Because we all use figurative language. All don't don't shut me out. As if there's a door between us. So we, you know, figurative language. And while Creole listened, Sonny moved deep within, exactly like someone in torment. Now this is the older brother who hadn't listened to him, who didn't understand him at the end of the story. So I'm still have that question. Um, uh, somebody asked, Taylor Wright asked, where is the climax of this story? This internal story. So this is our main character who had his heart closed to his brother right here at the end. Sonny moved deep within exactly like someone in torment. I had never before thought of how awful the relationship must be between the musician and his instrument. And there's a little reflection there on that, which you can read. I think it's, it, it comes, it backs away from, we had a climax and it backs away from it down toward the, uh, the resolution. Our book calls it, or some books call it the denouement, which is French for um, tying things up. But I don't think the denouement is happening yet. But right there, there's a paragraph about pianos. Um, but I'm still tracing that theme of listening in conversation. Watching Creole's face as they neared the end of the first set, I had the feeling that something had happened. Something I hadn't heard. Then they finished. There was scattered applause, and then, without an instant's warning, Creole started into something else. It was almost sardonic. It was I, it was am I blue. And, as though he commanded, Sonny began to play. Something began to happen. Just read that yourself. Then Creole stepped forward to remind them that they were playing, that what they were playing was the, the blues. Then he stepped back very slowly, filling the air with the immense suggestion that Sonny speak for himself. I may have to write this theoretical essay I'm talking about because I feel like this is deep. All right. So, um... Tone, figurative language, I said a little bit about plot, and I gave you a demo of how to use quotes to trace a theme that's running through something. Now, this first essay, I make it kind of easy. You just have to describe your reaction to a piece and tie that reaction to one of the elements we're studying. But if you want to do that trace a theme, that's like more advanced. That's called analysis, taking it apart. So if you find three quotes on the same theme, uh, think of them as ladders in a rung, and you can climb that ladder a law from quote to quote to quote and you got your essay. Um, you have a little intro that says what you're going to do and the intro could just be a restatement of the guidelines. Read the essay guidelines and the intro restates and if you're doing something different you just, you know, you just say that so it's clear and then you have a conclusion and I think of a conclusion, a boring conclusion can just restate everything you said as I have just said blah 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 and it's over. That's okay. Or you can have a more interesting conclusion that says something new that sums up everything you've said and then leaves us with something to think about. Get, let your personality come into it. Uh, I'm the type of uh, reader and grader that uh, if your personality's in it and I feel like you, you have thought about what you're saying and you're committed to what you're saying, uh, that's going to score high. And is, is there a typo in it? Is there a, a comma splice in it? I don't care if you've got something to say. Uh, if you've got 17 comma splices, I'm going to tell you, yo, you've got to a ton of comma splices here. You're going to look uneducated. Why are you paying tuition to look uneducated? So I'm going to explain to you how to fix the comma splices. But you know what? There's two comma splices in this short story because good writers break the rules. 
And, and he didn't want to start a new sentence. So he just used a comma and it was clear. There was, I did not get tripped up. No reader is going to get tripped up with that comma. So that's what you're asking is, is this clear to my reader? And you just revise it a little bit to make sure it's clear to your reader. So I've covered those things and, um, The ending. Oh, do you want to talk about the ending? I think we should talk about this in week three, the ending of the piece, and also the ending of uh, the Joyce Carol Oates story, because somebody's, a couple of people are already screaming in the discussion forum, how can it end there? And we don't know what happened to her. Did he, did he take her out into the woods and kill her and rape her? Or did he not come into the house? Or what happened at the end of that story? We don't know for sure, but what's the tone there? What's the mood? What do you think? the author was talking about. So the ending of this story, he sends a drink up to his brother. I mean, his brother's had this major breakthrough and the audience is like, we've never heard jazz this good. You know, he's like, he's in his groove. He's playing. Um, I can't even read that section because I cry every time. Okay. I'm not going to read it. Okay. Then it was over. Um, Creole and Sonny let out their breath, both soaking wet and grinning. There was a lot of applause and some of it real. In the dark, the girl came by and asked, and I asked her, to, okay, girl, oh, come on. I don't think there's a girl working in the bar serving, okay, sorry. In the dark, the woman came by and I asked her to take drinks to the bandstand. There was a long pause while they talked up there in the indigo light, and after a while I saw the waitress put a scotch and milk on top of the piano for Sonny. He didn't seem to notice it, but just before they started playing again, he sipped from it and looked toward me and nodded. Then he put it back down on top of the piano. For me then, oh shit. Now I have to do this because I've already done 30 minutes and I don't want to start over. For me then, as they began to play again, it glowed and shook above my brother's head on the piano like the very cup of trembling. Well, what is the very cup of trembling? That's a biblical illusion. Remember, I told you Baldwin was a famous child preacher before he said, okay, this is, there's a lot of BS here, you know, and he, uh, uh, spent time with the nation of Islam and, you know, he was a thinking person. Um, but he knew the Bible. Okay. And a lot of writers, a lot of people, in fact, one time I had to teach the Bible. I was at a school and they're like, you're going to do, you're going to do great literature and it includes the Bible. And I'm like, I can't teach the Bible, but I started teaching the Bible and I knew that whole Bible because the stories are out there. They're in movies. They're everywhere. You know what I'm saying? So, um, this is a reference to Isaiah, the suffering and fear that have plagued the people. Um, the cup of trembling is a metaphor in, in Isaiah for all the suffering that the uh, Israelites went through when they were captives in Babylon. Um, a reference, a reference that not a lot of people would get. Probably the time when he wrote it, he's thinking most people would get it. Um, but th that's what it is. So the, this, he, the, the drink is up there and Sonny's playing the piano and the, and the liquid is trembling a little bit in the clear gl glass. Like the, like the very cup of trembling that Isaiah talked about in the Bible as a symbol, as a metaphor for the Israelites' captivity in Babylon. So that ending, like I said, the ending of your essay could do, it expands right away. It brings in the Bible, it brings in slavery, it brings in history, it brings in human suffering. And that's the question. I think all great art, one of the questions all great art is addressing and there's this quote that I've uh, been using for years from Baldwin, and I'm going to end on this quote. Um, for while the tale of how we suffer and how we are delighted and how we may triumph is never new, it always must be heard. There isn't any other tale to tell. It's the only light we've got in all this darkness. Every generation, every culture, has to make this tale new, how we triumph, how we suffer, how we are delighted. All of that has to be told over and over. We can't read a book that was written in the 15th century and feel as much unless we're like literary historians and we're just interested in what did they write in the 15th century in that culture. Um, so we need artists 
writers, musicians, dancers, sculptors, rappers, everybody has to keep working. They have to listen. They have to go to the void and listen the way Sonny and the way his brother realized Sonny had to do to be a musician. Okay, that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for listening. And um, I'll see you in the forum.